Today we're giving a labor shortage update. We did this video a couple years ago, and today we're gonna to talk about how to find and retain good labor in the construction industry. What's up guys? Welcome to the Metal Roofing Channel. Welcome to Q&A Mondays. I'm Thad Barnett. Make sure you subscribe if you're new. We release metal roofing and metal construction content every Monday and Wednesday. And today we're talking about the labor shortage, how to find and retain good labor in the construction industry. And today I have Adam Mazzella from Sheffield Metals back. Thanks for being here, Adam. Thanks, Thad. And we have Todd Miller back on the channel. Todd is a wealth of knowledge in the metal roofing industry and the construction industry. And Todd, we're so grateful to have you on the channel. Oh, thanks so much. I still love what you guys do. Great work. Appreciate it. So as I mentioned today, we're talking about labor. Um, and as a business leader, how do you find and retain good labor in this challenging market that we're seeing today? And we did this video a couple years ago with Todd, and we're giving an update uh, as to where we are today here in um, quarter two of 2022. So first question I've got for you guys is, you know, what, what really has changed? We know a lot has changed, but uh, give me kind of uh, some cliff notes of what we can expect, you know, that's different from our last time talking. You know, I, I think one thing that's really happened is workers are more and more looking at culture and taking the workplace more seriously, especially as we've seen sort of the things that happened as a result of the great resignation, as it was called. Uh, I think that workers are looking more at those softer things in, in employment. And, you know, it certainly can be a challenge um, in the construction industry because I think there's a lot of preconceived notions about the construction industry and what job sites and workplaces are going to be like. Um, fact is, most of those really aren't true anymore. Um, it's changed dramatically even in the years I've been in the business. Um, but I do think that that's one of the big things is all employers need to think more about their corporate culture um, and more about selling that corporate culture when they're out recruiting folks. Labor was the number one issue that a lot of, uh, you know, managers, business owners had even before this. And, and you know, the, the impact of, you know, the great resignation post-pandemic, that has just compounded that. So things driving uh, a lot of this is people looking for a change of scenery either due to money, uh, but to pile on what Todd said, it really is about culture. What's what's in it for me? What can my career look like? I don't want to just show up and punch a clock and and be a laborer and and be insignificant in my work career. Yeah, and you know one thing that that I've noticed that is really helping to drive that is just relationships between workers in other companies. You know, they say, hey, my friend has these great benefits somewhere else that they never have heard about before, or maybe they have they don't have experience in, in their own company. So they're like, well, maybe there's something else for me. And that word of mouth has really driven a lot of people to transition, change jobs, look for something else and kind of realize that, you know, maybe their talents are, you know, going to be more appreciated elsewhere, or at least uh, in their minds, you know, given more benefits, more opportunity elsewhere. I know several years ago here at our company, um, a change that we made was we strictly hire off of referral and personal connections anymore. Uh, someone had told me early on in my career, never hire a friend. I, I kind of understood their point, but it really made no sense to me because if I'm looking for people who have shared values, shared work ethics, um, perhaps even shared goals in life, I'm most likely to find those within my own affinity groups and people I know and, and people I already uh, have some association with. And so that's, you know, the way we have hired for a lot of years typically is we are not doing any sort of advertising. Now, that said, I do use LinkedIn a lot also for hiring. And I'll also say I've never been in a situation where I had to go out and hire 40 people all at once or something, and that would change the dynamics dramatically as well. Um, but I have found LinkedIn to be a pretty powerful way to connect with folks. And, you know, if you look at their LinkedIn, maybe you cross over and look at their Facebook or something else, you start to get a feel for that person and, and start to figure out, okay, well, do we have a culture that's going to appeal to them at all? And people have to understand, you know, there there is no 100% correct culture out there, but it's a matter of being very purposeful, knowing what your culture is, and then finding people who are attracted to that and share similar values. 
as an employer, you want to find people that are going to want to contribute to your culture. I mean, you, you, you may know them. They may not be a match, though, still. So bringing in people that can continue on that culture, carry on that culture, uh, diversify that culture, but also add to it are critical as the workforce moves forward. So you guys mentioned the great resignation earlier, and that's something that, you know, obviously we didn't talk about in our last video. So can you expound on that and explain kind of what that is? The great resignation really, I, I think, occurred in part as a byproduct of the pandemic, but I think things were kind of reaching a critical mass even before the pandemic. I mean, prior to the pandemic, you, heard, you there was a lot of push for increased minimum wages, you know, not just regionally, but nationally. So people trying to force what employers do for whatever reason. So, you know, when you look at it and what the pandemic did, it pushed a lot of people away from the office, but you still needed people inside the plants to get products made, to get things built out in the field. And I think a lot of people looked at it and were like, you know, hey, what about me? You know, we're what made this thing go around, you know, I'm of more importance than that. You know, I'm looking for higher pay. I'm looking for better benefits. I'm looking for a better culture. You know, I'm looking for a place to hang my hat and say, hey, I contributed. They let me know I contributed and I felt it. And I can and I can go home a happy individual uh, that's part of a bigger team. And, you know, the great resignation didn't just affect the number of employees at companies. It really had um, a resounding impact on the industry. Todd, can you Give us some other things that maybe that has impacted and now has changed the labor market. As I look back over my career, and I even think back to watching my parents, you know, when I was growing up, I mean, I've seen these ebbs and flows over the years where, you know, it's it's either a buyer's market or a seller's market in, in employment. And suddenly the virus, the uh, COVID, and, and plus uh, the great resignation forced us into a seller's market um, for labor. But I think the other thing that happened there was it wasn't just based on income anymore. It was much more based on benefits and culture and things that, you know, my parents in the 70s never even thought about in terms of a workplace. I mean, frankly, for them, it was all about how much you're going to pay me. And now suddenly it expanded way beyond that in terms of what workers were thinking about. And so, but, you know, we'll, we'll go through other cycles over time as well. We'll certainly hit uh, other cycles in the future where it becomes a buyer's market for labor. That's just part of the ebb and flow of the economy. But the reality is there have been things brought to the table now that aren't going to go away. And so companies need to think about that. And I think that's one of the things that, again, getting out of this mold of what people think the construction industry is, I think that a lot of contractors, you know, especially the small to mid-sized guys, haven't thought a lot about culture and things in the past. But now they're finding that eh, I'm probably going to have to. Yeah. And, you know, these large uh, contractors who uh, from time to time suck up a lot of workers in a market um, are really heightening the awareness of the small guy that, well, how do I retain my folks? So it, it's, I think it just has brought everyone more to think about. And, you know, the end result is, I think, a, a better workplace, safer workplace, more enjoyable workplace, higher quality of life for everyone. And, and those are all good things, but it can be a little painful to get there at times. And we're going to talk more about retention later. But first, let's talk about how do you find people in this market right now? So, you know, the number one thing, this is pre-pandemic and still today, it's referrals. You know, Todd mentioned it earlier. It's referrals. You still have the traditional avenues of, of LinkedIn and, you know, of, of recruiting services, whether it's an online forum or physical recruiter. You know, Todd alluded to this as well, but you have kind of your people, you know. So it could be a faith-based organization. It could be where you uh, give back to your community, you know, and look for people there. And it, it's that constant canvassing as a business owner, as a business manager. You know, if you see somebody that gives you good service, if you see somebody working hard, if you see somebody, you know, taking care of customers, you know, drop off a card. Say, hey, you know, I, I like what you do. I see you're working hard. You know, let them know that they're important 
And that's your culture for the business that you're in carrying over. And that could pique their interest as well. There's any number of, of places to look. Um, it, it's really about putting the effort there. It, it's working with trade organizations, uh, trade schools, high schools, colleges. Um, if you know you have a hiring need uh, or one coming up down the road, you don't want to wait until you have that need. You want to start planting seeds now so when you actually need that, you can start you know, cultivating, you know, the people that you've been looking for, for months or years. And you don't want to uh, put yourself in a box and only focus on your industry. You know, there's a lot of people who are looking to switch industries and get into something new. And as, as long as that person has the qualities that you're looking for, you know, you can bring them into your industry, your business and, and teach them that. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just going to mention a recent situation we had, we were recruiting for an office position and uh, I just threw an ad up on Facebook, man, unpaid, just on our Facebook page, just a little blurb about what we were looking for. And, you know, it was literally within an hour, we had had six people share that and say, hey, I know this company, it'd be a good place to work for. And, you know, currently our leading candidate is somebody who came off of that, uh, hearing it from someone that they knew. Um, so again, it ties you into those, that common base of folks. Any tips on the hiring process itself, you know, in this market right now, is there anything different that you guys would do as employers? Obviously, when someone is looking at a company anymore, they're going to go to your website and they're going to go to learn about you. And so I have long been a proponent and, you know, we see this at some size companies, I don't typically see it at real big companies nor real small companies. Have long been a proponent of having a our people page on your website, where as many of your team members who are willing, uh, you put pictures up there, you put a little bit about their story, um, because I think that can go a long way in terms of that due diligence research that a prospective employee is going to do before they come for that first interview. And so you even want them going to that page and saying, hey, I, I, I saw so-and-so on your page that works for you. I didn't realize they worked here. And you start to make those connections as well. And, you know, that's something I've talked a lot about for contractors, too. Even in the sales process, they need to bring out those stories of their team members, bring out the story of the crew foreman, uh, bring out the story of, of the gopher on the, the crew and let that prospective customer know exactly who's going to be showing up at their house or at their property uh, to do the work as well. And so I, I think that's a big thing for companies to do is tell the story of their people. And I think that helps on all sides, both with recruitment and with getting customers. You're hiring for culture first. I mean, we'll find a fit if you fit culturally. And, yeah, you know, if you're a family business, wear that on your sleeve. You know, you're it, you're not just a number. You're important to us. You know, you might wear multiple hats where you might be a specialist in a bigger, broader organization, but, you know, wear those things on your sleeve. You know, we, we wear our culture, you know, up front. We're, we're very clear on the type of individual we're looking for. I mean, it's humble, hungry, smart, you know, lifelong learners. We want people that are always going to continue to push themselves, continue to grow, and we make that clear in the interview process. And that's not for everybody, and that's okay. Um, but it, if, if it is for you, you know, you might not have all the tools, but you're buying in, you're drinking the Kool-Aid that, that we're drinking all day, every day. You know, we want prospective employees to, to feel it, not just say it's something aspirational. So, A lot of folks would tell me I was, I'm crazy for this, but – Yes, we've hired folks many times without really knowing exactly what they were going to be doing when they showed up here. Um, we just knew that it was a person who was going to fit our team. We knew some of their skills and we were going to figure out the rest. And uh, I've done that numerous times and uh, those folks are still with us. So once you get someone in the door, how do you retain them long term? I think one of the things, and, and I'm going to speak more to your audience who are contractors, um, just because uh, I've seen this work so well for them, is to have some sort of clear path of advancement in your company. So um, typically, you know, entry level is going to be entering at entry level. But that person needs to know, okay, once I've developed these skills, 
you know, maybe my pay changes or maybe I get a different title or maybe I get to wear a different color shirt. I've seen that done by crews, but, you know, have some sort of clear path. And I also think that's just something that millennials um, in particular have really wanted is uh, they really want to know what's the purpose? Why am I going to do this? And why should I learn that skill? You guys are paying me without knowing that skill. Um, so what's going to be the benefit to me when I do know that skill? And so I think having that pathway is is really, really critical right now. And frankly, I, I think that's probably part of the reason for the great resignation was folks left the organizations where they were looking at and saying, I don't really see a future here or I don't know what my future is going to look like here. And on the other hand, if if you can start presenting that future, I do think you'll start to reduce the number of resignations and, and things that you're getting as well. And and a number of things you could do above and beyond saying, hey, here's your clear path forward is, you know, what programs do you have available? So somebody, you know, even if they don't say, hey, I'm, I'm frontline, hey, I'll be a, a shift supervisor, I'll be a team lead, I'll be, you know, the, the department lead, you don't know that. You can't predict the future. But along that journey, you know, you're going to need, you know, training, you're going to need tools, you're going to need uh, opportunities to become a better leader. What as an organization are you doing to give that person those tools? It's not just, hey, uh, you know, we got an opening. We're going to plug Tim in that hole. What has Tim done to develop himself? What has the organization done to allow Tim to to step into that role and, and not just have the role but flourish? So I think career tracking is critical, but also saying, hey, here's the milestones. Here's the tools that you'll gather along the way to be able to be successful in these roles. And when it comes to learning skills, you know, there's a number of industry organizations, manufacturers that offer certifications. You know, how does that play into an employee employment relationship? You know, I, I certainly think that team members appreciate that if they are sent away someplace to get some training or have someone come to them. Um, now, certainly most contractors are probably going to continue to do their training through a mentor sort of relationship on the job site, on the crew. But um, still investing in your folks to, to send them away to get some specific training is, uh, means a lot to people and can bring a lot of new things to your, your organization as well. Um, I'll give a quick shout out to a contractor I know up in Michigan called American Metal Roofs. And I mentioned earlier this idea of giving different color shirts to folks. Um, well, they do that. And as you advance, as you get trained, as you learn new skills, you wear different colored shirts. And they also use that even with their customers. So they'll tell their customers, okay, um, we want to hear your questions during the job. If you have any, look for the red shirt guys, because those are the guys who have been trained on how to answer questions. Those are the guys who know everything going on with your product project at any given time, look for a red shirt guy. And so that serves them also the benefit of having that property owner go to somebody who's brand new on the crew and is going to say, well, I don't know, this is my first day, which is never a good impression for anybody. Uh, so they've developed this whole colored shirt mentality of doing it, which is a pretty cool thing. I think something that everyone should be really watching closely is the NRCA's pro certification program they're developing. Uh, I had first heard about this program a couple of years ago. And, you know, at the time, it, it sounded like a really neat way to recognize professional installers in our industry. But as it's developed, it's also developed into what I think is going to be a pretty powerful program um, of testing and certifying folks to verify their skills. And then eventually, you know, I, I think we may even see manufacturers writing into their specs that this should be done by a pro certified installer, or we may see building codes uh, talking about pro certified installers. Um, so there's, there's definitely something there and it's in place right now, I believe fairly fully for the asphalt shingle uh, installer. Um, but Metal Construction Association has worked heavily with NRCA and also has developed it and is in the process of developing it for installers of various types of metal products, uh, be it standing seam or low slope metal roofs or metal shingles. Uh, so I'm, I'm really optimistic that ultimately long term, this is going to be a good program. 
So is this going to be for a company that gets this or is this individuals that can get certified? What does this look like for roofing contractors or their employees? So the certification, and I think this is rightfully so, although it may cause a little heartache for some employers, the certification stays with the individual. But the concept is that uh, I, as an employer, will start to train people to be able to take the certification test, make sure that they know what they have to know, and then we'll have them have someone come in, an assessor come in and actually administer the test. And the tests are going to both be written and a hands-on test. Um, but again, it's it goes back to that thing of, okay, I'm going to build into my team members in ways that other companies are not doing it. Um, but yes, the certification is tied to the individual because that's the one with the skills. Well, and there's uh, above and beyond that, you know, there is risk. It's like the, the, the paradox of training your employees. So, you know, ultimately, are you training up people that are going to leave you or eventually compete with you and things like that? But would you rather have not had the best employees because you train them along the way and, and you're continually backfilling the, the folks that you're training. So it is a tough double-edged sword, sure. but there's things you could do as an employer to say, hey, you know, I want to send you some to some training. There's a cost associated with it. Um, I will cover that. Um, you know, commit to me for X period of time in exchange for that. And, you know, it's it's not always perfect, but it is continuing that development of your people giving a, a shorter runway for making sure you retain them. Um, so there's opportunities there too. Absolutely. And, you know, I don't want to lose sight of the fact either that you still have a lot of good training programs out there from individual manufacturers. Um, and those are certainly great things, I, I think, to tap into as well. So as an employer, you know, what are other companies offering? What are employees really looking for when they're trying to find a new job? Yeah. So above and beyond the culture, which, you know, is is very, very front and center, you know, you want to make sure that you're offering benefits, um, you know, things such as medical benefits, health care benefits, retirement benefits. So, you know, 401k and not just a 401k, but, you know, are you willing to match things? Um, companies that can offer benefits that also offer tax credits or tax breaks to them, those are great. Those are things you can pass along to your employees. Um, additionally, some of the things that we've seen, you know, coming, you know, these were like fringe things two years ago plus, um, are now very commonplace and, and those flexibility. So you've got work from home, you know, it might not be a full-time thing. You know, we're, we're a firm believer that, hey, we need you in the office to, to preserve the culture, but it might be one day a week, two days a week, you know, saving somebody, you know, that extra gas money on commuting. It might be, hey, I've proven during the pandemic, I can be very effective working from home. Okay, great. We can, we can give you a day here and there or a day a week. Um, not always available from a manufacturing or a contracting side. So I don't want to get too hung up on that, but things you could do could be like a, a four-day work week, you know, instead of, you know, five days, uh, you know, look at four days, four tens. So you're still getting somebody there, they're 40 hours a week. And one thing from a personal note, you know, I, being at home with your family, you know, it, it really was, you know, one of the perks about the pandemic. And I think a lot of people, you say, hey, I'm going to give you a three day weekend every week. You could be, you know, having four setups in a week versus five, you know, that's improving the efficiency of a manufacturing or an installation operation potentially. Uh, that could be a good perk for somebody. Um, that might be enough to tip them. It might be enough to say, hey, I'm not going anywhere else. I love, you know, my three day weekend. I can spend time with the family. I can spend time on my hobbies. You know, this is this is what I want to do, and I'll even sacrifice what I'm willing to to work for to have that three day uh, work week. So, um, other things, you know, that that might be perks to employees. Uh, you know, you could have hiring bonuses, so you know, uh, retention bonuses, things like that. Oftentimes, these things are uh, things uh, employers can get a tax credit on. So. If there's an opportunity there, there's no sense in not passing it along to employer employees. I agree that uh, on the four-day work week, a lot of folks really like that and like the aspect of the three-day weekend. I've also seen employers use that, though, in a way where they say, okay, 
we are going to request some flexibility on what four days we work this week um, so that hopefully you can schedule out the rain days. May not be the best day for someone to have the extra day off, but it may mean that that team member works four days that week instead of just working three. It can be beneficial to them in terms of increasing their total number of hours a week if you've got some flexibility on moving the rain days to be that off day. Awesome. Well, I think we covered a lot of good information here. And if you have any questions, please comment down below. We'd love to uh, answer those in a future video. And Todd, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you know, what, what's going on with you? How do people find you? Um, you know, what kind of content are you putting out? Sure. Um, so we've been doing a lot of things recently with a, a new podcast called Construction Disruption. And uh, Construction Disruption, we're really looking at what is that future of building and remodeling going to be like? And so basically, we'll go out and hear about something new. Maybe it's off-site construction. Uh, maybe it's some new trends in terms of lighting or whatever. And we'll go out and find an expert and bring them on the show to interview them about it. So what we've really tried to do is create a nice library, if you will, of podcasts and videos um, that folks can go to and learn about the future of our industry. And our hope is that uh, that brings in some new folks into the construction industry and gives them a resource to learn about things that, oh, that's pretty cool. Maybe I'd like to do that. So we've had a lot of tech subjects on there as well. So folks can always reach me. Probably the easiest one is Todd at asktoddmiller.com. It's probably their easiest way to reach me. Subscribe here to the Metal Roofing Channel. As always, I'm Thad Barnett. We'll catch you next time. Oh,